Welcome, Natalia. Um, so see you. Fantastic to see you. Natalia is based in Kiev, of course, and uh, tonight's event is dedicated to Natalia's uh, recent publication with Just a Peer in Ukrainian and dedicated to her dispatches from Crimea, which she visited very often. And needless to say, Natalia is a very well-known journalist and reporter in Ukraine and a prominent media figure. Uh, and now I would like to introduce our moderator, and it is Oliver Barlow, uh, who will appear on screen in a moment. I actually would like to uh, make a little disclaimer. In fact, um, the, the moderator who was announced previously, um, Oliver Carroll, uh, a Moscow-based uh, UK journalist, unfortunately is ill. We really hope that it's not COVID-19 and we wish him the best of luck with it. But we were also very lucky to have Oliver Barlow with us, who is also a very prominent UK journalist. He's based in the UK at the moment, and uh, who is very well known for a number of his investigative uh, reports, uh, focusing on dirty money, on um, uh, lots of issues related to the former Soviet Union space, um, Russia and Ukraine. And he also um, extensively traveled to Crimea before and after the annexation. I also would like to give you a couple more details about uh, Oliver's background. He moved uh, to Russia in 1999 uh, to work as a journalist and he stayed there for seven years and reported on the war in Chechnya. And he's also an author of several books, one of them focusing on um, um, dirty money in London and another one on um, Caucasus, on the war in the Caucasus. So uh, we wholeheartedly would like to welcome you to our event, Oliver. Thank you very much for joining us. And now I would like to pass the floor to both of our panelists. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. I hope my internet connection maintains itself. Uh, the advantages, <coughs> advantages of living in Wales at a time like this is that I can be surrounded by fields. The disadvantages is that I'm not on the fibre so my internet can be a little bit patchy, but we will see where we get on to. Um, Ollie Carroll got in touch with me today, said he wasn't feeling very well, and asked if I could step in, and I was really delighted to do so. Um, Natalia Gumenyuk was the first port of call, I think, for all Western journalists, or all serious Western journalists, who turned up in Kiev pretty much from 2014 onwards as someone you could go and talk to, have a beer with, who would tell you what's actually going on. So it's a real uh, pleasure and a real honor to be here um, asking her some questions about her new book, um, Lost Island. Um, it's about Crimea, Natalia. Um, why island? Why, why island? Surely this isn't an island. Uh, so, first of all, of course, I'm very glad we have this uh, opportunity to talk. I was supposed to come to London in the end of March, but were cancelled, but I think in particular this uh, moment uh, it's good we are not uh, forgetting Crimea. Yeah, so the title in Ukrainian and in Russian, the book is also translated into Russian, is The Lost Island, uh, because I think not just for Ukraine, uh, but for, for everybody, the territory which technically is a peninsula had become somewhere lost far away. It, uh, and I even would, you know, use this opportunity saying that even now at the outbreak of the COVID-19, you know, my book doesn't speak at all about it, it's happening right now, but it feels like, like they are somewhere uh, on their own, you know, totally, uh, despite, you know, uh, Russia um, occupied Crimea. Uh, I talked today, in particularly before the event, uh, to ask what's going on, and it really feels like mentally and uh, you know physically the territory is not really accessible uh despite you know uh, there is a land crossing now it's cut cut down you can't really reach there it's shut uh, it's shut down you, you you can go there but it's both about kind of this mental isolation from you know the rest of the world i will say um i'm we, on Zoom function has a, as, as you can see at the bottom, if you're looking at the screen, there is a Q&A option. If you have any questions for Natalia as we go along, please um, type them in. I can see one already from Anthony Wills. Thanks, Anthony. Um, any other questions, please type them in. I can see them 
and if uh, they look relevant as we go along then I might pop them out and ask them of Natalia as we continue otherwise we will have a period of time for questions and so um, you're going to have an opportunity to ask Natalia lots of questions but before we uh, carry on with questions and uh, Natalia is going to show some photographs uh, that go with the book and then read a section. So Natalia, I think you're going to be able to share your screen. Is that right? And so we should be able to see what you've got going on. Uh, before that, I would just explain, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing, I will, I will do that right away, uh, that the book, um, the, the, the photos I will show you, it's more or less speaking about the book I've written. I happen to be one of the Unfortunately, right, quite a very few journalists, Ukrainian, Russian, or foreign, who've been regularly uh, traveling to Crimea. So book is chronological. Uh, it started with the dispatches from 2014, 2016, up till the last, uh, the end of the last year, 2019. And uh, uh, therefore, while uh, moving you uh, for, for this, uh, my, my photos, uh, some of, uh, most of the trips I've done myself, uh, but uh, the, the many, many of them, they are uh, from the, uh, you know, some colleagues traveled with me. So uh, while while showing that, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll a bit explain how the book is built and what was this six years old journey. Uh, so um, here it is. Um, yeah. I'm doing that. So uh, now you can see the uh, photos. It's the book starts in uh, 2014, as I've come to Crimea in the day of so-called referendum, 16th of March 2014. And here you see how it was organized. It was not an official uh, kind of place uh, where usually the any kind of the elections taking place, and that's where everything started. Um, so I'm yeah. So you can see the, uh, you know, how the, the, how the, uh, this premise look, a lot of people in the, you know, Russia t-shirts uh, at that particular place, the colleague of mine um, uh, who was a Russian citizen voted. Um, so, but at the same time for many, many people, the, uh, the, the place looked like just normal, uh, so they went on with, you know, fishing and other things. However, you've seen quite a lot of these kind of men uh, who called themselves at that time self-defense. And uh, that was my first, uh, you know, trip, which I called, and, and, the, and the chapter, which uh, I named, I give a name, the uh, shock, because we were all shocked about what was uh, going on there. And you see, of course, those pictures of the, you, you hear, you see there, this little green man, they are not little, they were not green, they are military, but also from time to time, was of course was very little time to stop and just to understand how magnificent this place is and i also explained that uh, many people ask you know do i have you know people with the pro-russian views of course i have you know i talked to all those old ladies and gentlemen at that moment uh and there are a lot of their views and discussions some of them were really surreal i probably would draw attention to this photo when you see the Ukrainian military and the, you know, Russian military, um, because we, I, I've arrived already, but it was very clear that, you know, uh, there is no way to fight it. Um, it was more or less overtaken, but still uh, the, the, the Ukrainian militaries haven't yet surrendered. And what I want to remind that, uh, that how many of the equipment, like it was not just little green men, there were, you know, really, uh, tanks there. There were a really, uh, you know, uh, weaponry there. So it was not that, you know, easy uh, place where just there were, you know, guys with the guns. Uh, but I also want to mention, for instance, that there were still uh, the rallies uh, for the uh, United Ukraine. Uh, but it was shocking as well for me to see how fast they had been, sh how people were, you know, shut down. And I later come back to uh, Crimea again in a, a bit less than a two months. That would be the chapter two of the book where I describe the confusion. 
uh, you see here the photos of the first March, uh, first May uh, Labor Day uh, demonstration with Putin, with others. Uh, but I think that th that was uh, at that moment it was very clear because things were happening in the Donbas, so p we were all um, people were just confused, you know. Though it was already not that shocking moment, but still it was so many things unclear. So uh, there was no to do something because people were, you know, digging, uh, we, we, we coping with all kind of the prog problems. And when coming back uh, in 2017, um, uh, 2016, these are photos from that, these are the photos from Sevastopol, and these are very cute little guys, of course, uh, which were at the Victory Day military parade, but still, I think for us a lot, it's um, very tough to see this militarization where how kids, for instance, are used for all these big kind of propaganda marches. Uh, and at that time, I, the, the story which I started to follow was a story of the Crimean Tatar, you know, this ethnic, uh, it's not ethnic minority, it's the, um, these are the um, native people of Crimea, Crimean Tatars, because we found out that the story of the Crimean Tatar deportation had been uh, told uh, so, and there were so many people alive still in Crimea to tell their stories, which had become even more symbolic. Uh, it's very important for them not to leave their land, but I want to draw attention. It's not very spectacular uh, photo. Uh, but uh, this is a photo of the street where we come back with the lady. You see the photo of her grandma, and that's where their house was. And she was not allowed to get back to this house when she moved back to Crimea in early 90s. But we went back again, and it was quite, uh, for me, symbolic uh, that there was a Russian flag uh, there at, at, at that house, which a while ago belonged to her parents. And that was the time where there were really repressions against the Crimean Tatars started. Uh, they were one of the protagonists of my book. Uh, her husband was one of the first. He was just a practicing um, Muslim, very important for his community. He's still in prison. He would stay there for another 10 years. At that time, it was just a few months and you know people were very much confused. The searches in the mosque started. Um, and again, I will show them elderly Crimean Tatars who were telling their stories. And again, you see again the kids with the guns uh, or kids on the um, you know tanks. Uh, that was already 2017. I was coming back um, again and again. It was a particular story about the economic situation there. I want to draw attention to this particular picture, uh, you know, monument to this so-called little green man. Um, uh, which was there, why I find it also very special. You see the later, this man, uh, this is the uh, Mykola Semenai, a famous Ukrainian journalist. Uh, he was at that moment forbidden to work as a journalist in Crimea. And recently he just managed, he was kind of freed now and uh, come back to Ukraine this February. And he told, uh, in, he, he written the, um, you know, the, um, um, column on my book and actually mentioned that while he was in Crimea for five years, he didn't, it was very painful for him to take a camera and take this photo. That's how difficult it can be emotionally to kind of see those, we say, usual pictures. Uh, I think for many of the Ukrainians, uh, you know, you want to remember these trolley buses traveling from Simferopol to Yalta. So um, that's what I also looked at. Uh, but and also I want to draw attention to there are many kids in this book, uh, stories about the kids. Uh, what is peculiar in this case that, you know, in all these rooms, you see the kids and they are all the, the, the children of the political prisoners. Uh, there is an organization taking, taking care about them. Uh, it was for me very tough to kind of find out myself in a room where you have 50 kids and all the kids are, ki uh, are children of the political prisoners. Um, you see the mother of Oleg Sinsov. We were doing the documentary about uh, at the moment when Oleg was still in prison. It was not clear what will happen to him. Uh, and I think it's also, um, you know, I important to see like places like Yalta. Um, this is also another story I'm doing in this in, in, the, in the chapter, which I called like ire uh, or rage. Um, this is a, a territory near a very famous Soviet um, camp uh, for kids, uh, the resort. And uh, you see there the construction works. 
And there are activists like this guy who is the supporter of the annexation of the Crimea. He is one of the leaders of the Nash, Krim Nash uh, movement. But he was, you know, a strong anti-capitalist as was shocked by these kind of things that there was a construction work there. He's doing the protest against the current government. Um, so these people are like that. I, we've also done the story and there is a piece of the book about this, how is to be Ukrainian in Crimea. And this is the Ukrainian church there, which which is shut down currently. There is a uh, few portraits, uh, you see them in color. They were made in, uh, already in uh, Kiev. Uh, these are testimonies of the uh, parents and relatives of the political prisoners, Crimean Tatars. There are 70 of them now. They traveled to Kiev and uh, we managed to kind of, in, it's, I worked with a photographer to make this, they tell these human stories of their relatives. Um, so I think that they're very strong uh, personalities. And uh, to just to understand that behind this figure of 70 political prisoners, there are those people. And uh, this is also a very um, photos of the chapter seven, which I called uh, loneliness um, because it's, uh, uh, because it's uh, the, the, the stories uh, which I filmed in the um, Kerch. Uh, there was the uh, attack in the school. A guy, 20 years old guy, killed 20 of his um, friends, uh, colleagues in the in the school. That was the biggest shooting in the history of uh, Ukraine and Europe. And unfortunately, I happened to be our crew was the only team from the journal traveling from the mainland Ukraine. That was very painful for me to understand that. Um, and that's why I feel like the, this part of land is just so lonely. This is this famous Crimean bridge uh, with Russia, but it doesn't make the city feel and people there being less kind of uh, left behind everybody. And there were commemoration, of course. And um, these are the, 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 the photos from 2019. Uh, I've come back to uh, return to some of the protagonists of the book from uh, which I met within all these years. This is the town of Bakhchi Sarai. Uh, to that was a mother of one of the political prisoners, Mikola ba um, Volodymyr Baloch, who is now freed. At that time, it was not clear. And uh, the, the chapter called Disappointment, uh, we can discuss why, whose disappointment is that. Uh, you see, again, it looks like the life is normal, but not really. Uh, you know, the people are playing. There was an anniversary of so-called annexation. There was kind of a theatric uh, stage uh, things happening in Yalta. Uh, you know, you see the photo of Putin on the embankment in Yalta. And probably the one of the stories I also dispatched as I've made about a very, very surreal event. Uh, that was the... Uh, celebration by the bikers uh, who are supporters of Vladimir Putin and who created this kind of a strange festival. Uh, you see Zelda Stonov, a famous figure, a friend of Vladimir Putin, and they kind of done this kind of Ruski Mir, what I called like Russian uh, world burning man kind of an odd festival uh, um, where more or less uh, all of the supporters of the so-called Russian Spring gathered together. Um, so these are the um, the stories uh, which I wanted, you know, the photos to show to give you the impressions. Uh, what is that? Uh, and uh, to, to give you this impression. And now I also want to read you um, a few. Uh, I was asked to to, to do that uh, to read a few. Uh, parts of some of the chapters um, and uh, um, I started I decided to start it from the chapter two uh, it's uh, the chapter called confusion i it was done in Sevastopol Sudak and uh, uh, was the story about it had happened in early May 2014 so here I'm reading it over the past months and a half, prices have increased, the vegetable seller explains in the Sevastopol market. I'm recording his interview on my phone. An elderly couple passing by hear this and intervene in the conversation. What are you talking about? Everything has become cheaper. But I personally raise the prices. The product is not delivered from the mainland any longer, the seller shrugged. Yeah, but if you count the increase in pensions and salaries, it turns out cheaper, the couple starts again. 
I just can't understand how can this be? Customers argue with a seller who had raised the prices that the products has become cheaper. It's not even two months in the annexation, so the first salaries and pensions haven't yet been paid. During the same trip to Crimea, I will hear another conversation which is not less surreal, a dispute between two neighbors in a resort in the east of the peninsula. The rumors are spreading that Ukraine's water supply to Crimea is about to be shut off. But this will not be a problem because we have an underground lake in our village, one neighbor insists. But we don't have any underground lake here, another man answers. It's an undisputable fact that the underground lake doesn't exist. I returned to Crimea a month and a half after the annexation at the end of April 2014. The Russian military is no longer hiding behind the image of little green men. The attention of Ukrainians is pulled to the Donbas, where cities and towns are captured one by one. Yes, yet I promise to, re to return to the people I met during the first days of the annexation. Crimea is no longer a hotspot. Everything has already happened, and the residents of Crimea, as expected, are drowning in the bureaucratic conflicts of life after the annexation. Registration, resident permits, Russian number plates are not yet required, and Russian passports are primarily issued to civil servants. It's not yet clear which state program student will pass their exams. It is unclear which diplomas will be issued and how to get enrolled at the universities. The banks are no longer working. Uh, the, so I made... I'm taking the pictures at every ATM for private bank out of order but for technical reasons. The largest bank before the annexation, which now has its account blocked, all salaries and savings are frozen. In any other bank starts to operate, there is a huge queue. I meet the person who is number 4,625th in the line. From dusk till dawn, there is something to think and worry about. And certainly there is no time for politics and even less for geopolitics. Almost everyone has urgent private issues. Uh, the chapter four, um, it just explains a bit how russified the, the region uh, had become. It's called Ire. It takes place in March uh, 2017. When you enter Crimea, cell phones switch off. Only Russian mobile operators work here. You can buy a local SIM card only with a Russian passport, although a year ago I managed to buy it without a document, but with three times more expensive. The visit coincides with four days off in Crimea as they were celebrating Defender of the Fatherland Days. Despite the weekend, there are serious traffic jams in Simferopol. It's a car boom in Crimea. Cars have become cheaper. A Lada costs about 200 bucks. Meanwhile, a new Ford costs 9,000. Russian military security officials and bureaucrats were redeployed to Crimea. Of course, they brought their families. Sits of Tambov Wolf, Smolensk Stew, Tula Sugar, Sour Kubain Burionka, Clinic Siberia Health. Strange for the Ukrainian people, names are signals of how quickly this process of replacement can occur. According to Google Maps, one of the streets in Yalta is called Kiev Street, although it was renamed to Moscow Street. Eight million people in Russia have a dependence to alcohol. A sober Crimea is invincible. Listen to us from Crimea to Chukotka, from Ivanovo to Novosibirsk. The radio announcement is played at the Alta Sea Uh In 2018, I decided to make a story on what is the true cost of remaining Ukrainian in Crimea, and this is a small part of it. This summer I sold fruit at the market, says a Crimean woman who refused a Russian passport near the same stall where I used to buy fruit on my own clients. Before the annexation, her family owned a successful business, which mainly dealt with foreigners visiting the peninsula. Now she decided to refuse the lifeline job she dedicated 25 years to. And despite the fact that the EU citizens are allowed into Crimea with a Russian visa, and if they enter via Ukrainian checkpoint, they don't any laws, this family deems earning money in such a way under occupation unethical. Apart from personal reasons such as age and housing, many people remain in Crimea out of principle. They don't want their native land handed over to another state. If we leave, there will be even fewer people who disagree with annexation, she explains. The family who prior to annexation had higher than average income now has to count every penny. Even ordinary household items have become a luxury, let alone holidays. Another family member who used to be a teacher now makes a living as a laborer on a construction site. Because those who have kept their Ukrainian passport and received permits to live in the Russian Federation have to annually confirm that they earn no less than 11,000 11, rubles, around $2,000 per year on the Crimean soil. 
And um, to finalize, there are a few extracts from the, one of the last chapters. It's called Disappointment, and uh, it was uh, written in March 2019. The main thing is to watch what you say around children or to teach them that whatever is heard at home can be repeated to a stranger, they tell us, while we are visiting an ordinary Ukrainian Tata family in the town of Bokhchisarai. In 2014, the same household spoke openly about their fear of repression. A year on, they've learned that it's better to keep quiet. For every Facebook post, you could get reprimanded at work, even if it's not written under your own name. But at home, over coffee and tea, you can talk with your neighbors about the Ukrainian presidential elections and even about the occupation. These days, it's easy to be branded a terrorist in Crimea, especially if you're a Crimean Tatar. As early as spring 2016, lawyer Emil Kurbidinov warned against participate, participating in the Majlis, the representative body of the Crimean Tatar people. If you're involved with the Majlis, you're accused of extremism. If you're religious, it's terrorism. Systematic detention of Crimean Tatars began a year after the annexation. Over 70 Ukrainian citizens are currently being held as political prisoners in Russia and on the annexed peninsula, and most of them are Crimeans. When I spoke with the relatives of the first detainees, many believed it was a mistake. At first, wives and children were cautious, but they quickly began to talk about their grief. They wanted to be heard. Then they began organizing the movement known as Crimean Solidarity, which is mostly made up of relatives of political prisoners. Another organization called Bizimbalar, Our Children, provides monthly financial assistance to the children of political prisoners who are under age of 16. Each child receives about $90 per month, which is worth a lot in the region. At one of their first meetings, March 2017, there were 40 such children. Now there are 168 of them. We come to the visit of the wife of one of the first Crimean Tatar detainees. I have known her for a long time. She is tough and uncompromising. To my surprise, she isn't willing to give an interview this time. Before the wives and children of political prisoners were left alone, but now even they are subjected to raids and persecution. During the most recent search, the women were forced to undress, which is especially humiliating for practicing Muslim women. We've come to her home for the first time. Prior to this, we've only met at a lawyer's office. The house is high on a hill, and if you are walking from the bus stop, you can see the sea in the distance. While we are walking, she says that before, she would often host her friends, both from Russia and Central Asia, but even though they know her husband personally, they are all unwilling to criticize the annexation. They try to avoid the topic altogether. And uh, probably the last, uh, it's a different story. I think it's also one of the most important for me in the book. Uh, it's, I mean, you, you'll hear it now. It's the last piece I'm reading. Oksana died, I'm told, when I show a clip of her as a substitution therapy patient recorded in May 2014. I physically can't bear it. They forced us to lower the dosage. This means constant pain, constant weakness. No one wants to help us, she told us then. I met Oksana in Simferopol five years ago, near a hospital that offered help to drug addicts up until 2014. For seven years, Oksana had been in a program where patients were given methadone in place of street drugs under doctor's supervision. Although this is a common practice in many countries, it's prohibited in Russia, which means it's banned in the annexed Crimea too. Before the annexation, there were over 800 such patients in Crimea. In the spring of 2014, they were begging for help. Oksana lasted three years in occupied Crimea. Her mother tried to save her, but she couldn't. She died in Kiev, right in hostel. Loneliness broke her. When I found out, I broke down in tears, even though men don't cry. What bothers me more than anything is that all of these deaths are for nothing, Ihor tells us. He is former patient himself, one of the few who left for mainland Ukraine's temporary. He returned to Simferopol after his father first fell ill. Hundreds of people died horrible deaths during those years. One hangs himself around, another jumped from the ninth floor, Ihor recalls. No one knows exactly how many of the 800 patients are now dead. A charity called the Alliance for Public Health, which worked with addicts in Crimea, stopped counting their deaths in 2014. According to their data, about 120 former patients had already died by that time. These are also the figures that come up in the UN documents when the topic was raised during the international meeting. Russian officials became annoyed and insisted that everyone was receiving assistance. In 2014, it also became more difficult to assess patients' information since it was stored in medical facilities that had come under Russian control. The parents of the deceased cut off 
all communication with Ukrainian journalists. A year later, law enforcement began to conduct searches among families of patients who had moved to the mainland or given comment yeah, in the past. I met a friend recently and found out that Misha from Marino, a rather well-known person, had hanged himself. Zhenya was put in jail. They caught her with street drugs. Later, she died too. I know a family that had a baby born after they started taking methadone as a part of the program. Nine, now they've gone back to the street drugs. They abandoned the child with the grandmother and grandfather. My husband's classmate died here in Yalta, right on the street. And there are so many. I don't know about in Kerchev, Patoria, Feodosia. If of 800, a couple of hundred are still alive, that would be pretty good, says Inessa, recalling her former acquaintance. She asks us not to film her face and to change her name for the publication. She says that she's not worried for herself, but for her son. The state always has one more bullet, my father taught me. So uh, probably that's it uh, from, from, from reading. It's hard for me to read the book, uh, the whole book. It's not yet in English, but yeah, here I guess I uh, pass the world to Oliver. Thanks for your attention, of course. Um, that, was, that was amazing, Natalia. Apologies if anyone's confused that the background has changed behind me. I moved while Natalia was talking to try and gain a better internet connection, which I hope I have. Um, it was quite extraordinary seeing those photographs. Um, took me right back to what it was like in Crimea in 2014. It felt very weird being there as a Westerner, um, as, a, as a Western journalist, but it must have felt quite scary for you. There's been a couple of questions you've asked uh, from this on, on the Q&A already. What, wasn't it dangerous for you going down to Crimea then? Uh, yeah, back then, in particularly in March uh, 14, it was probably the most dangerous. I'll tell uh, the reason. At the time I worked for Hromatsky, it was quite a, you know, a known media. Uh, we were broadcasting a lot from the Maidan revolution. Uh, so some of the, my colleagues who come there earlier, and uh, during the Maidan, we were streaming live. Um, so there were the pictures appearing, you know, uh, that, you know, not a death threats, but for instance, the photos of the uh, journalist. Uh, so when you were streaming live, um, you know that there were cases when those Cossacks or military would come up, um, would, come, would come to you. Um, we know the cases where journalists were bitten uh, because at that moment, uh, that was very uh, peculiar moment because uh, the Russian authorities, they didn't want journalists to show that there are Russian soldiers. They pretended they are not there. Uh, I've come um, still early enough, uh, but my background is in the conflict reporting. I covered the wars in different countries in the Middle East prior to that, so I felt like it's my obligation. I kind of knew how to work undercover. Uh, so we, we changed, you know, before we were very open and I worked very candid. I worked with a um, good friend of mine, a, for, a journalist from Estonia, and I played the role of his translator. He was generous enough. So I was like the, the journalist, uh, but I playing the role of uh, a translator for, for, for another journalist. So it was made of a cooperation that I'm not a, you know, so, so like I, I, I was honest about what I was doing, but yeah, you need to work very candid then. Um, as maybe later as well. And I was say, I mean, actually, uh, David Addis has asked about this as well. How has that changed since then? Um, it, you know, Russia isn't an easy place to be a journalist, to be honest, um, at the moment, certainly, and it hasn't been that easy for a while. How is it for you in Crimea in particular? So, of course, uh, for me, is the, there is, of course, the issue of the security. And first of all, the issue for security is you really don't want to talk to the security service because then you would disclose the names they would ask you, whom you have met, what you've talked, and you really don't want to get into that. Um, I have a strong position that I'm a Ukrainian citizen. Um, luckily, Ukrainian citizens are, they, they don't need to get visas to get Russia, and Russia considers Crimea to have be their territory. So I just go there as the, uh, you know, with many, many Ukrainians who travel. Uh, and you just be very, you, you need to be very cautious. Um, I think that some things change because as I said, like the moment of 2014 was very special because there were just, just thugs, the real thugs on the street, you know, who you, you don't know what will happen. But there is a different type of uh, danger now because you know, there were so many people arrested, including the journalists. So, of course, you don't know how to behave. You know that, you know, there were, um, you know, just people who are innocent, taken back, imprisoned. Uh, but I still think that, like, that um, it's our role. Um, 
I think especially when I was, uh, I mean, I've, I've traveled regularly, but uh, in the last years I was coming with the cameraman and I was explaining that, especially for instance, when there was this shooting in Kerch, I was just, the, the question was like, what I would ask, uh, what I would answer the, 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 body, the, the, the border guards. And I said like, look, if she asked, the, 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 you know, why are you going there? I would say like, you know, the kids are shot down. Won't you let me in? Um, so somehow it worked, <laughs> but you know, you, it's always a bit like the, the last time, unfortunately. Um, in those, particularly in those early days, um, in 2014, it was an incredibly uh, partisan environment. It was very difficult to express a viewpoint um, which was counter to that held by you know Russian speakers in Ukraine, in particular. Of Russian speakers in Crimea in particular. How, how did you manage um, in talking to people? I suppose I find that, I found it very hard, um, you know, as a representative of a third country. How, how was it for you? It must have been quite difficult to remain partisan in talking to, unpartisan in talking to people and to get people to trust you. Look, I think that the, it's about, I think it's not about the partisanship, it's about the law, you know, like as a journalist, you see like, you know, there is a, it, the, the Russia had broken international law. So, you know, I can really clearly argue that, you know, the presence of the foreign troops on the ground is not right. So maybe, you know, I wonder if it's a bias or just an objective fact. Uh, but I think there is something very special. Some of the, I, I think that um, about being a Ukrainian journalist, either this is Donbass on Crimea, I adore and I appreciate uh, that uh, when f when Western journalists, foreign journalists coming to places like Crimea to tell the story, because of course it's difficult for the Ukrainians to be there. But I think there is something uh, when you come that you're coming from Kiev. I think that there is some will to pass the message. So, you know, if you're really open, I always felt that like, it, 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 it's very hard emotionally. You feel like you meet the people and they want to tell you everything they want to tell to the Ukrainian government. And, uh, you know, wherever they are, you know, afraid of propaganda. So I find that uh, being, you know, they talk to you as the official Kiev representative. You really don't want to argue with them, but it also helps to get the information because it feels that like people who are you know opposing to the ukrainian state they somehow it feels like there is something untold which should be told and you are the tool for this but um, no, of and course, this, and is that still the case now is that do you still get that sense is it is it still possible to 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 talk to people in that way now i mean it it, it seems you know, I haven't been back for a couple of years, but I've found it increasingly difficult to find people who are willing to talk to me. Yeah, it's difficult. And what more for me is the, the most sad, uh, you know, pro professionally uh, sad. Um, I, the, the way I'm trying to write, the way I work, uh, the way I do my reportages, I try to, you know, to make a patchwork, to speak to as many people as possible, you know. Uh, so these are the book or the, my, my journalism is not just about the political prisoners or, I know, Ukrainians in Crimea or people who agree, you know, that annexation is bad. Uh, and, of course, it's very hard to get officials, but we understand that in any conflict, in any place, uh, the most of the people, they try to stay away from politics. Uh, and they are the majority, so-called majority, and usually they are least represented because usually you have the extremes, but never like this silent majority. And for me, it was always, a, you know, how I can get, how I can give voice to them. Um, what do they say? And uh, the challenge is that talking to a Ukrainian journalist for many of them is already considered to be a political uh, action. So like, if, because they think like, oh, if we appear on the Ukrainian television, um, if we just speak about, I don't know, how to make business, how to, I don't know, open a shop in Yalta, uh, maybe that would be used against us. So this is indeed the, let's say, less sensitive, the most less sensitive stories about like a normal life and normal people. Those were the hardest to get, but probably... Uh, because I really insisted that these are really the people I want to show. First of all, they are never presented. Uh, maybe it kind of in some in some cases I succeeded. And how over the years you've been going back, 
How, how do you think people's viewpoints have changed? Um, I mean, back in 2014, there was this sort of sense of euphoria among Russian speakers that was quite, like you, you describe, it was quite hard to understand. I remember talking to someone who, who had a bank account in a Ukrainian bank. And I remember saying, you know, what's going to happen to your money? And him just saying, well, Putin will sort it out. It was this sort of sense of, you know, just complete trust in Putin. You know, how has that changed, do you think, among, among Russian speakers in Crimea or has it? I think like most of the people are Russian speakers in Crimea, <laughs> just because it doesn't, uh, you know, what I probably underlined that the language that people speak doesn't uh, influence the political views. Um, yeah, I just like, it just happened. Um, look, uh, my last uh, chapter is named disappointment. And I think it's about everybody, you know, like that everybody is kind of disappointed that things are not, that everybody is too, too, too big to say, but I mean, many people are, of course, things didn't get uh, splendid or wonderful. And I think euphoria was gone maybe like two years already after. Um, but even it's it's also about the Donbas. It's even about every you know Crimea as well. It's super hard for anybody to admit they were wrong. <laughs> you know, like for, for human being to accept that they were wrong is you know enormous emotional effort. So really, you just understand that people are not celebrating any, any longer. But it would be very rare when you would see somebody that like, oh, I've done the mistake. So you have the people who, who say that. So for instance, there is a very interesting story about the, uh, I mentioned this uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the book I, I read about an activist who was for, um, you know, Crimea Hours movement, pro-Russian activist. But he was really like this, anti-capitalist so for him it's such a so shock that russia is a capitalist country that you know like you need to pay that they are you know destroying the the beach in his uh, native gurzuf and there were also two other journalists who are really clearly pro-russian they supported the annexation uh but there was some kind of corrupt they, they investigated corruption in the uh, new authorities they were uh put on trial for a few for a few years they've been in uh prison uh it was all fabricated uh, they were freed uh already this winter and one uh, left for the mainland ukraine another is still trying to dispute it in the Russian courts. Um, and he still kind of believes he, he, that he can prove something in the Russian courts. So, you know, these people are there. Uh, but yes, it's true. I, I think we should all admit that there were lots of money invested in Crimea. Uh, it's, it, it's, it, it, it's fact. Uh, disproportionately more than to other regions uh, of uh, Russia. Um, but you know that uh, you mainly those uh, people who enriched themselves who get more kind of money were the um, civil servants uh, you know bureaucrats policemen but how you can i remember i talked to a man who said like you know his mother is very happy that his um she, her, her pension is higher but her son lost a business so she's kind of saying that like oh things are good because my pension is higher but it's when you really talk about the situation you know the loss of the business of the son is a bigger loss of the income for the family but in the head i think that's the issue that it's very hard to admit uh, that probably i could done something differently I think I, I certainly found the hardest group to talk to in 2014 or to connect with were um, Russian speakers who favoured uh, continuing as part of Ukraine. They were they found it very uh, difficult to talk out publicly. Um, have that? I mean, have people become resigned now to being part of Russia? Do you think in that group? I mean, you know, locals. Um, they just say, well, this is how it is now, and we're just going to get on with it. Do you think, or, or is there still a a sort of a, a, a significant minority of people who who would like i'm not talking about crimean tartars we'll, we'll come to them later but but of of slavic people whether ukrainian speakers or russian speakers who would like to 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 return um to to ukrainian rule my my strong you know uh, you know I, I i don't make judgments of the book of reportages uh, in the way i'm writing but of course my strong opinion is doesn't matter like when anybody who has power 
somehow that would be accepted. You know, if something happened and Ukraine uh, regains Crimea back, people would uh, adjust for that. And interesting enough, I've just like right after a month ago, uh, yeah, a month ago, had another foreign journalist who'd been traveling, uh, um, also a different journalist, but from Estonia. And I helped a bit like to give advice. And when he come back, I asked like, so what's your feeling? And it was his first trip. And he said like, look, it feels like these people don't have views. And even like, doesn't matter what, they would become Ukrainians again and would praise Ukraine if all of a sudden Ukraine would be stronger. And I think mean, that was not just my observation, but I think that, that in then most of the people just adjusted this is a reality, we can't do anything. So why we need to dispute it? It's interesting, I, I, before 2014, I spent quite a lot of time working with and reporting with from Russian nationalist groups all over Russia. And I don't remember anyone ever mentioning to me that they really objected to Crimea being part of Ukraine. Like literally, I don't think it was ever mentioned in 10 years. And then as soon as Putin said it was a big problem, then suddenly everyone was super enthusiastic about it. So it is weird what people suddenly can get worked up about. Um, one of the things, Anna Reid has just answer, asked a question. Um, you mentioned that, that Russia has spent a lot of money in Crimea. Has the Kerch Bridge made a big difference to, um, to how things are there? Look, uh, Kerch uh, Bridge uh, have done difference because of course it was very painful not to, to have just the ferry. Uh, but uh, Crimea is disproportionately still expensive because, you know, uh, it's still everything should be brought now from, the, from Russia, not from the Ukrainian mainland. Uh, you, you can't really oppose the, the fact that the bridge is there. Even like, I'm as a Ukrainian journalist, I would be very unpopular to say, but yes, of course, uh, it hadn't made worse. Uh, to the people. By the way, now what I understand is what's happening today, uh, the Crimeans would be happy that it's shut down so the COVID-19 is not brought up from the rest of, uh, of, of, of Russia. Uh, but my point is different. That I think that I'm answering this question uh, from time to time about the, um, uh, whether the economic situation has, been, has become better. Um, it's complex. It's not that easy. It depends for whom. Uh, you know, also it's, you know, the money are really present, but there is also a lot of corruption involved in, uh, you know, like, so for instance, now there is a case that uh, the, the people in the, the right investigation, that the military, Russian military, important Russians just overtaking the seashore are the best places. So you kind of, you see the beautiful buildings are uh, uh, built, but to whom they belong, does it make it better for the people? Uh, but the, my, my point is that if you just really think about that in terms of the economy, uh, that will be strange uh, if you accept that, especially if you're a Westerner, because that will mean that a, just a rich country has the right to annex the place which is a bit more poor, if provides people with more money. But in that case, if we agree about that in 2020, in 2014, it means that, I don't know, like any European country, any, you know, you know any US or any rich country would have the right to just take the neighboring country, pay a higher salaries. But the, the, so in this regard, this logic, like this excuse for annexation uh, is, totally wrong for, um, but doesn't mean that we, we, we can't, you know, honestly admit that the money are, you know, uh, some money are provided. Um, the, the, the Crimean Tatars have been an incredibly well-organized community since the 1960s. Um, and they were certainly the most visible opponents of, um, the, the, you know, Russian, the little green men and the most visible sort of supporters of Ukraine back in 2014. Can you talk a little about how things have changed for them? Um, obviously, the Medjlis has been shut down. You know, how are and their leaders are not allowed to go to Crimea as well? Uh, but how, how are things for them when, in, you know, have things changed? Oliver, I think it particularly would be interesting for you to hear that because uh, the Crimean Tatar, it's not a, it's the indigenous people of Crimea, but it's quite a secular, it happened that it's a quite a secular um, 
Muslim community. Uh, you know, it has never, there was never any terrorist attack in Crimea or any terrorist attack plotted by Crimean Tatar ever. Uh, historically, they are actually, in fact, very famous by their nonviolent resistance. It's in their, you know, uh, national, uh, you know, pride to, to 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 say that we have since the Soviet times. They are like, yeah. and um, so when uh, the cases started, and uh, you know, th there is this propaganda that we well, know because the um, Muslims uh, they are possible terrorists and that's really happened it was and what for me is important to mention that since 2016 17 the security service officers uh, and F, for instance the heads of the fsb were brought from the uh, regions in russia like tatarstan or caucasus where indeed the uh, radicalism islamic radicalism is a problem we can admit it, it so and they looking at crimean tatars through this lenses as as all potential you know terrorists and extremists um so there are deliberate persecution and as i said like uh currently there are 70 crimean tatars behind the bars by the way just preparing for this webinar i talked to their you know some of their lawyers and for the last month there, there is a really strong campaign that they are in prison and prisons are very vulnerable places uh, during the covid 19 uh, pandemics and some of them are, are you know um, are old uh, some of them are you know in poor health conditions so without the uh, and and we can you know know for sure that cases are fabricated so they are particularly vulnerable because it's indeed it's enough to be a crimean tatar to be treated as a potential extremist or terrorist um you you also spend a bit of time with with religious minorities um baptists and so on um how how are things for them obviously there's there's uh, more religious freedom in Ukraine than in Russia. Um, how have they managed to to adjust? Is, is, is the situation improved? So, so the, uh, no, the Baptist, uh, for instance, Yagova witnesses, they are forbidden in Russia now. Uh, so uh, that's no way. Somehow it's one church <laughs> which is allowed, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, for a while, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church uh, was, you know, there was a church uh, place in in Simferopol where people gathered. Uh, we I've come to one of the services. There were very few people there. It was like the center of the you know uh, Ukrainian community. Uh, but it was shut down with all the bureaucratic reasons. So somehow you can say that uh, and by the way again uh, I'm I'm going back to the religious um, to the, uh, the to the Crimean Tatars again uh, I talked today to these people uh, uh, from Crimea and and they said that some of the imams they are now providing the uh, and because they are some some of them are not the official muftiyat uh, and they are providing the help to the people during the pandemics and uh they could be accused of 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 kind of some illegal activities just for doing that so it's it, it's it, it's really not easy I, I thought we might give an opportunity for some of our attendees to ask questions i'm i'm, I'm flying blind here this may be a complete disaster um can we try? Um, uh, we've got quite a lot of questions about geopolitics, um, and I thought it'd be quite fun to run through some of them. Ursula, Ursula Woolley, can you, are you prepared to speak? Can you unmute your microphone? Can we see you? Are you still there? Maybe she's gone. She, look, look, Ursula has appeared. Look, I can see her. Here we go. Look, this is the, the suspense is killing me. No? Oh. Hello, Ursula, you've unmuted. Shall I ask the question? Would that be easier? All right, I'm going to read out Ursula's question because um, though I can see her black box, I'm not sure. Oh, no, here she is. Ursula, speak. No. All right. I'm going to ask it. Ursula. Ursula asked, what is the current Ukrainian government doing for Crimea and what do you think it should be doing? Obviously, the Ukrainian government's got quite a lot of um, priorities right now. Um, but is it doing anything for Crimea? Do you think is, is, is it helping at all? I mean, what, what else could it be doing? Uh, 
So I think that the, first of all, the Ukrainian position on Crimea, and I think a lot of people understand that nothing can be done without the international pressure. So the the the, re, the only real policy is, uh, you know, being strong in the UN and you know making that the sanctions against Russia are still there. And within the years, we've seen a lot of you know cases when either the companies are breaking those sanctions. Um, this is very. Critical, I say, because anytime any, you know, Western company coming to Crimea, it's really a huge PR. It's like more or less like if any uh, third class former French MP is coming to Crimea, that's almost considered by Russian media as the, uh, as the fact as if it's recognized internationally. Um, so that is important. Uh, everybody speaks about the coherent uh, policy towards Crimea. Um, you know, there is the representative of the Ukrainian president uh, for Crimea. Uh, there are some bodies, so there are the MPs from Crimea in the Ukrainian parliament. Um, my take is the most important is to really help the people from Crimea to travel to Ukraine. You know, uh, it's not yet that well, um, uh, well organized, uh, for instance, to help kids from Crimea to study in the Ukrainian universities to have a special programs for them. I should uh, give a credit to the current government or I mean new government because for five years those checkpoints between uh, you know not controlled Crimea were just horrible uh, so they kind of organized the facilities uh, within the last years so there are some uh, but still there are so many things to do in the law to make the lives of the people who moved from Crimea easier uh, but yeah to, to honestly saying apart from the western uh, the pressure of the sanctions by west you can can't do much well, that gives us a very good link to the next question I was hoping to bring in. Is, is, is Anthony Wills available? Anthony, are you available? Are you prepared to speak? Could you ask your question? Um, the one you asked at 7.02 p.m. Okay. <clears throat> can, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I do. Okay. My question is, um, what can Western powers do to bring influence to bear on Russia to stop the illegal occupation of Crimea? So I do think that there could be more sanctions. It's true. You know, it happened for, for so many, for instance, th this is a one point, uh, not to make excuses because for instance, the Russia, Russia in, uh, create the laws in a way, for instance, for some companies to operate in the mainland Russia, uh, they uh, create the rules that they make exemption, except, uh, exceptions and still are able to operate in Crimea. And little by little, those things are, you know, are, are allowed it's not fully getting back to the usual um, I think this is a very very good moment also the pandemics is a very important moment to put a pressure and saying that Russia should you know like I don't know free political prisoners and uh, this is a moment when the West could really see why the um, annexation can't be toler tolerated uh, because the people, especially the moment when we see how vulnerable people are there, uh, for instance, there were many, uh, when I remember, uh, even like 2014, we were talking whether the, I don't know, like the, the systems like Visa and MasterCard could, you know, shut down. I think that the limit to the sanctions towards Russia is not yet uh, fully used uh, and the demand to free political prisoners would play a, a, a huge thing because uh, so far the Russian pressure didn't uh, didn't uh, pr pressure from the West on Russia didn't end up in anything sufficient. Uh, it's interesting the possibility of Joe Biden as US president he was he was pretty good on Ukraine I'm um, leaving aside you know, the fact that it's been the most boring subject in the world for the last year but the but um, he's he was he was quite good as President Obama's point man in Ukraine. So him as president might be. I'm not saying he'd be better than President Trump because who could be better than President Trump? But but it might be good, right? You ask myself, maybe you know. I think that uh, I mean it's a t totally different topic. If if by you know I think like we we'll, after like pandemics, the whole summer we again would hear about what Biden da, uh, did in Ukraine. Uh, but yeah, I think that the persistence of the also the U.S. is 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 critical. All what I'm writing in the book is saying that 
it looks like nothing really happens in Crimea, so we can just wait. But what I'm trying to say is that every day is a day of pain for many people. Um, Anthony Breach is next. This is my, my geopolitical tour of the world. Anthony, are you prepared to ask the question that you asked at 7.19 p.m.? Yes, that's right. Uh, sorry for my uh, work logo popping up earlier. I'm using my work Zoom account uh, to sneak in. Nice um, but my uh, question was, um, what would need to change in Russia for Crimea to return to Ukraine? <laughs> you it's know, I think that, uh, this is a small question. No, 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 it's good. You know, there shouldn't be this president, I think, first of all. The democratic Russia, uh, the only democratic Russia should be. Uh, that's how, how we see that. Um, I don't see any other, other way. Okay, so this isn't, uh, it's, it's, it's not likely to happen anytime yeah. soon, I, 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 the, current, the current thought. Um, there's been, a, there's been a couple of questions from two different people about the role of Turkey and, and Erdogan. Um, is his um, involvement in the Crimean Tatar issue, is that helpful, do you think, or, 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 or not helpful? I mean, does it, does, it, does it sort of kind of try and, does it present an impression of them as being slightly foreign to Crimea, being supported by the Turks, or is it helpful to have an ally like that? So uh, I think there was a huge Crimean Tatar community in uh, Turkey, historically. Uh, they were moving in 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, there were two famous uh, leaders of the uh, Crimean Tatar Majlis, uh, Femchi Gos and Ilmil Umerov, who've been imprisoned. And they were freed uh, because of the President Erdogan appeal to Putin. They were actually, in fact, not just freed, they were exchanged for some. I know, uh, bad people as well. Uh, but what we say, Erdogan is also very, uh, Russian, Russian uh, uh, Turkish relations are all special. Uh, they depend a lot on geopolitics. Sometimes they are foes, sometimes they are friends. So you can't really rely. <laughs> you know, sometimes you, we understand that when there is a problem between Russia and Turkey, uh, Turkey, is, Ankara can be helpful. And sometimes I think that the uh, Erdogan is maneuvering because, of, of course, Ukraine is a big neighbor. Uh, for instance, the important thing was uh, there was when, for instance, there was a Ukrainian military uh, ship uh, captured uh, in Kerch Strait two years ago. Uh, you know, there was a moment that probably, uh, you know, whether Turkey could uh, close the Bosphorus at that time, you know, uh, and, not, uh, and, and nothing had happened. So I think that the Turkey can do more because Turkey is a very important player in the Black uh, Sea region. The problem is that geopolitically, because what's going on in Syria, what's going on in the Middle East, the, the Erdogan is also maneuvering because also for Turkey, for instance, Ukraine is an important partner. So uh, there is very little, I mean, I think uh, being very honest, I think for Ukrainians, it's enough that Turkey do not openly back Russia. Uh, and this is this maximum because we know for sure that there were a lot of address uh, by Mustafa Jimilev, the Crimean Tatar leader, to Erdogan personally to free Alexensov uh, when he was in prison for a while, when he was on the hunger strike, and it didn't work. Okay. Um, there's a quite a good question just coming just now from um, Aliyah Ragoza, which ties into what you were saying about um, Putin, but also brings us on. Aliyah, are you there? Um, are you prepared to speak? There he is. Sorry, uh, Maria, I should have given you a warning about that one. Aliak, hello. Ooh. Okay, I'll. Oh, no. Hello. Hello. Um, um, hi. You ask a very good question at 8.05 p.m. Yes. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for joining. Um, it's really an honor to speak to you, Natalia. But I was, um, my question is, um, is it realistic uh, or whether there's a danger that a current Ukrainian government or perhaps a future one will accept a deal where um, occupation of Crimea is institutionalized and not questioned and recognized um, but in return, um, Russian troops are moved from Donbass and uh, there's an end to a Donbass war. Uh, would such a scenario be acceptable for Ukrainian government and also for Ukrainian people? Because I don't think that would be an easy sell um, for them. Thank you. 
Um, thank you. I don't think any way it's acceptable, neither by the Ukrainian government, by uh, no Ukrainian people. Uh, and I, by the way, I'm not very much cautious that this government would ever do that. Uh, what I think, and uh, that's also my opinion, I, I cover uh, not because I've been into Crimea, but because I'm in detail, you know, my, one of my profile is uh, covering the negotiation between Russia and Ukraine. You know, maybe uh, the, there would be the way that Ukraine, if there would be any concession, that Ukraine would still, you know, speak, internet, that Russia would accept that Ukrainians would still speak on the international level about annexation of Crimea, uh, but they just know that uh, it doesn't impact the situation on the ground. So I even if there would be any kind of the concession on the Donbas, Russia prefers, it's the point that Russia prefers to have these things separate, uh, but, but I don't think that it's, it's, it, it would be ever accepted by Ukrainian government. Uh, and it's not such a big problem for the for the Russia that Ukrainian government speaks, you know, um, in the UN, for instance, about annexation of Crimea, because it doesn't stop Crimea from being occupied. In fact, um, that's a that's a great question from Rebecca Harms, um, which oh. I've which I've lost, uh, but but um, I think it's a it's a really important one which ties into a lot of the themes you've been raising already. Hello, Rebecca, can you hear me? Can you, are you prepared to speak? I can hear you, but I don't know whether you can hear me. Yes, we, we do. Ah, that's nice. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is. So since uh, we all know that uh, Crimea is uh, a huge problem uh, concerning uh, every kind of human rights violations, um, and this is also internationally confirmed uh, by many official uh, authorities following the development. Um, so to, to this backdrop, I'm always wondering why so few journalists make it to Crimea and report about the situation in Crimea. I understand the difficulties, but there are other difficult places in the world and more journalists are going. Oliver, oh, will you help? I have my idea, but I would like to ask you. Can you, uh, can you also explain? And I'll have my my thoughts on that. I, I mean, I, from an international perspective, it, it's pretty hard these days to interest editors in 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 Ukraine. You know, I mean, it's hard enough to interest editors in Syria. Um, uh, and and I mean, as a sort of the great Trump factor, you know, he's just kind of it just drowns out everything in, in, in a sort of wall of nattering and it makes it hard to interest people. A, a story out of Crimea has to be really, really strong for an editor to be prepared to commission it. And, and that's hard because, um, yeah, it's tough. I don't know. What do you think, Natalia? I, I should say that, the, yeah, it's, it's a very unfortunate number of factors because, of course, to travel from Kiev is, it's quite a, you know, like you need to have too many permits. You have to have to have Russian visa, but this is a legal way. You can get a permit from the Ukrainian government, but it's like a 24 hours drive there, you know, so, and you'll be, uh, you know, asked at the checkpoint. You don't want to have these troubles. Uh, but if you report from, you know, if you fly from Moscow, then you break the, the law. But my point is it's not just for foreign journalists. It's also for the Ukrainian. Because this is this silent occupation. This story is about the silent suffering. And I also, in the intro of my book to the Ukrainian audience, to the Russian audience in the book, uh, which is translated into Russian, I explain that what I'm trying to grasp, this uh, everyday routine that, because ev even like I, for you, when I published my so stories a year after year, they were not super popular because um, it feels like, Nothing really changes there. You need to find story. It's, it's not so obvious. You know, this, okay, 20 political prisoners, 40 political prisoners, what's new? Or like, oh, the, 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 the salaries are, um, for instance, the prices are um, high and they are high. And so what is the problem? Okay, it's, it's occupied. It's like as if it had happened. So it's really um, requires the 
the, the really strong will for you to do this story and also be ready not to make this very obvious uh, very obvious story um, it, it, story about everyday suffering and I think this is the problem for the global journalism to tell uh, that these everyday routine problems mm -hmm. they are the biggest issues than maybe one incident um, I think we I've only just given Maria a warning of this I think we're going to try Anna Reid um, oh look she's managed to bring her up Anna are you there uh, yes I think so can you hear me yes hello Anna you asked a question at 7.35 um, which I thought was very pertinent to that last one in, involving about the, the human rights issue and the sort of ongoing grinding reality of occupation. I, um, I, I, was, um, I was interested in um, uh, something that was touched on earlier about the restrictions um, placed on people who don't take out Russian passports. So I was interested to hear more about that sort of economic and legal problems they encounter and also what what percentage of Crimeans have taken out Russian passports since 2014? So uh, where that most of the Crimeans uh, have taken Russian passport you technically there was one month around one month and a half uh, in 2014 when you can you know um, say that you don't want to have the Russian passport. Otherwise, you receive it automatically. Uh, uh, and there were not that many people who really had made it. Uh, but, but that is really problematic because you now, if you don't have a Russian passport, you're becoming a foreigner. So you, uh, you don't have a residence permit you uh, really can't work for the you know in a civil service the right issue for instance uh if you haven't taken this passport with receiving pensions the issues with the medical insurance so basically your life is impossible in uh, uh in crimea without a russian passport so those people a few thousands who manage it that's a very very hard life for them and i know that they were afraid that because it would have already more than five years uh that if there would be a couple of the uh, for instance some administrative penalty or they've done something wrong they could be kicked out you know uh because they are foreigners in uh, according to the russian law uh, many many people we don't know how many just probably do so, so many of them have two passports both ukrainian and russian um and uh, but i given you a difficult sto a story for instance of the old lady who is uh, i think now she's 78 um around 80 she built her house uh, that i remember uh, in early 60s and she has her private house you know like dacha uh, and it was properly registered and because she has a ukrainian passport uh, she uh, didn't really make it to re-register and to own this house. She was refused to get the proper documents. And you know, look, it's very hard if you're 80, you build this house like 50, 60 years ago and you're not allowed to own it. Um, that's how is it. Um, Bogdan Misko had a question um, uh, a little while ago. Um, which I thought was interesting because it's been quite entertaining that Dmitry Firtash, Dmitry Firtash has had his house in London frozen at the request of a Russian company because of a debt linked to his companies in Crimea, which has got so many layers of irony in it that it makes my head um, explode. Anyway, Bogdan Misko has a question about, um, about use of international courts. Yeah, but then we can we can uh, listen to you now, I guess. Oh, are you muted? No, 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 no. It doesn't look like you're muted, mm -hmm. but maybe there is something with this with the mic. Well, I can, I'll ask the question for you, Bokhtan, yeah. if you like. Um, the, the question was, um, which is why I was amused by the Firtash connection, is that um, is it possible? Uh, have Ukrainian or, or or other companies been able to use international courts? To, um, to, to claim any, any compensation for the loss of their property as no, a result? No, not, not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge, not so far, but that's also important uh, part of what Ukrainian 
uh, can do, but I haven't heard anything that it was successful. I know there are some of the cases, but it wasn't successful so far. Maybe I am not aware at, at, at those who I'm aware. Well, a connected question, which I'm going to ask as well, which came in from another Bogdan, Bogdan Pichinyak. Um, um, have there been any successful cases of taking the occupation authorities to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg? It's been a really important channel um, in Chechnya for defending the rights of people in Chechnya, or at least winning compensation for, for things that have been done to people in Chechnya. Is so like there, is, there is a there is a uh, office of the uh, prosecutor for Crimea. There is the office of the representative for the president of for Crimea, and uh, the special prosecutor. And they are building the case uh, uh, for uh, in in the Hague. So it's not in the European Court. Uh, it's a big story. Uh, it's running very slow. I still talk to some people here. Um, the, you know, there, there are some problems uh, maybe with the preparation, uh, but this is a long process and it's taking place, but not in the European Court of Justice, but in the, the, the Hague, in the International Criminal Court. Okay, and I think this is probably my last question. This is also from Bokhtan Pechenyak. Um, he says, predicting is a thankless task to be sure, but what is your personal impression how will the Crimea situation be resolved? Do you imagine that the occupation might ever end? If so, when? And how might it happen? I think that indeed, the, the, my, the, 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 what I think is interesting that always everybody gives us this example of the Baltics because they've been occupied by the uh, by, by Soviet Union and US and the US for instance have never accepted they are occupied and it's taken 50 years. I don't think it's an issue of the 50 years. I think that just in modern world, things are taking place way faster. You know, like you don't know what will happen in Russia in years. Things may happen. Things really may happen. But it's true that I more believe that it's clearly dependent on the uh, who is sitting in the Kremlin. Uh, you know, what would be the, um, the situation if Putin are gone, whether there would be people like him you know, like maybe tougher than him, um, uh, being uh, been there. We know that they're putting the Crimea, you know, into the constitution again. There would be this vote for constitution. It was postponed. So it uh, will, will, will change the constitution. Uh, uh, so for any kind of a democratic Russian uh, leadership, if it happens ever, that would be difficult to, to do something. But maybe also those constitutions should be, you know, changed again and brought back to, the, to normal. Uh, but as I said, I think that the, 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 if that happens, um, you should be prepared. But you know, the people will accept. Th that's my view as soon as it's happening. Uh, and, and true that uh, still by that time, there should be this international pressure. Uh, there should be still the, you know, uh, not recognition of uh, Crimea and the strong press. So um, the, the problem is that many people feel so powerless uh, if you speak about Crimea, uh, because it feels like it depends just on the Kremlin. Uh, what I argue that, yes, the fact to what, you know, whether who controls the territory, it really depends on the fact who is in the Kremlin. But so many things like the current political prisoners, like the economic situation, like the uh, opportunities, like making life easier. Um, now is a great opportunity for world, though the world is busy with pandemics, but just to understand, to understand how vulnerable the territory is because when there is not such a crisis it's look like oh so what you know like okay Crimea is under Russian occupation but now for instance we found out that this territory is caught up you know we don't know officially there are 34 cases uh, but I don't know whether there are 44 cases of COVID-19 there if things will be very bad in Moscow as it's looking now because there is a huge amount of the people getting sick Will Moscow send their doctors to Crimea? You know, I may hope, but I doubt whether they would fulfill their obligation as an occupier. Uh, I don't know uh, why they would think about the periphery. What I think is saying that this nice, beautiful piece of land really has become very similar to any frozen 
conflict, kind of this zone reminding of Transnistria or Nagorno-Karabakh or South Ossetia, you know, uh, where something in between. And in the these difficult like times for human security, uh, disregarding what are political views, are they Russian speakers, Muslim, Crimean Tatars? Uh, you know, I, 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 I understand that Ukraine can't, the world or Ukraine can't really help those people, though technically they are very close to us. You know, they are, they are the same, you know, they, they are the same country. And, uh, but, but I still think it's an interesting moment also to look at this situation and to see how we can not forget uh, to understand why the why the annexation can be tolerated, uh, but also to think like what, what, why, how we can just to use this uh, situation to remind about that. Wonderful. And before I give the microphone back to Marina, where do people buy your book? So we have the uh, so the book is so far available uh, in Ukrainian and in Russian as ebook. Uh, so at the uh, uh, there is a link, I think, in the Zoom call, and there is a link in the, uh, yeah, it's currently there in the webinar. There is the uh, link on the publishing house of Davnitsko Staroholeva, where the book is available in Ukrainian, but it's also a very simple way to buy it on the Google Books and the Play uh, in Russian. It's Ukrainian publishing house, so it's super cheap. Uh, but we really deliberately done translated into into Russian. Uh, that's the people outside of Ukraine who are Russian speakers uh, can do that. And now the most of the presentation, I, 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 I'm so grateful to all of you that you are participating in this webinar. To Oliver for you know moderating it for Ukrainian Institute for hosting the event. But as we understand, most of the events had been cancelled uh, in Europe and in Ukraine as well but I hope this is also the time when somebody can have a bit of time to read the books and don't forget. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Natalia, and thank you very much, Oliver, for this enthusiastic moderating. And uh, I encourage everybody to uh, get this book and to read it in lockdown, uh, wherever you are, in Kiev, London or elsewhere. So it's fantastic that we still have 73 people online and thanks to everybody who joined us. Uh, I would like to remind you that we will be thankful for any donation, uh, big or small, um, for Ukrainian Institute of London. And also would like to remind you that exactly in a week's time, we will have another event, which will be uh, dedicated to the um, repercussions of COVID-19 for Ukraine, uh, the business dimension and the healthcare. Uh, medical dimension and we will have two very exciting speakers uh, it will be Andy Hunter president of American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine and Ulana Suprun who is the former minister of health um, of Ukraine and a very authoritative speaker on healthcare issues and the panel will be moderated by Svetlana Purkalo uh, the EBRD um, of the board of Ukrainian Institute London. So I'm sure it will be a very interesting discussion and I encourage you to register in a week's time. Thank you for being with us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.